Um, so I believe this is the second time I've been in Salt Lake. Uh, the first time, I think, was 16 years ago, uh, when a group of us got together in Snowbird and did the uh, Agile Manifesto, which was kind of fun. So uh, the other problem I've got is that I average about two minutes a slide. And this talk has 79 slides. And I am starting 10 minutes late. So we'll see how this goes. So this is me. Um, I am getting a bit of a reputation as something of the grim reaper of uh, software. Uh, my most popular talk to date by far has been Agile is dead. And today, I'm going to tell you that OO is dead. Right? So really, I'm not a harbinger of joy and light when it comes to these talks. <laughs> However, let me give you a couple of spoiler alerts. Actually, they're not. But this is where I alienate an entire audience. The chances are you're not actually doing them. And the Agile talk, we'll talk about why that is. The OO talk, it's not your fault. Not your fault at all. But I don't think that the OO we're doing now is the same as OO as it was first described, in the same way that the uh, Agile we're doing now is not what we meant when we created the Agile Manifesto. Sorry, the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. So let's talk about OO, do some background on it. When do you think the first reference to objects was, roughly? Which decade? 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s, 50s. It was actually the 50s. Early versions of Lisp had references to objects. So when did we first have constructors and classes and things you would recognize as a modern OO language? 70s, 70s 60s. It was actually Simula was the first recognizably OO language. But it was not the same as the OO that we're used to, well, that we should be doing today. That came along with small talk in the early 70s. My birthday. Okay. Yay! Good for you. <laughs> I first out with Dan Engel, so it was my birthday. Oh, good for you. And it's exactly as old as small talk. You're exactly as old as small talk. <laughs> Are you used as much? <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, that's pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my point here is that none of this is new. In fact, this is really going back, you know, probably before most of you were born. Um, and we're not looking at it. We're not reading it. We're not understanding what was supposed to be done. So if you go back and actually have a look at, at the origins of OO and read what people were talking about. They were talking about objects, the idea of encapsulating state and behavior. And a lot of that came out of Simula because Simula was a simulation language. And when you're doing simulations, you need to have state and behavior all nicely packaged in a, a single thing. Encapsulation was a big deal. And encapsulation grew. Uh, probably the biggest paper about encapsulation was Parnas when he talked about modularity in the, 70s, in the early 70s. But that's a really big deal in OO. The idea of composition and delegation and the idea of inheritance. All core features to OO. So the question is, how well are we doing those today? So if we start off with objects, state and behavior, I think probably we're not doing too badly. If we look at like Ruby's or you know, any OO language, we're pretty much, you know, we have this concept of state plus behavior as objects. So I mean, give us a big tick on that one. Next one to think about is encapsulation. How well are we doing encapsulation? And by encapsulation, what I mean is that inside an object is totally opaque to the outside. So the outside sees something that does what it wants, and the inside then does it. The idea is that your object should be like the iceberg. right? So we have. The API, which is the one-eighth or one-ninth, whatever the magic number is, just that really small part that's visible. And then the state and the implementation are all below the surface. Right? You, don't, you never see that. Unfortunately, the 
That's not what we're doing today. What we're doing today is more like the Titanic. I would say that 90% of the code we write exposes far too much of the internals of our objects to be called proper OO. And there's kind of little tests of that. Does your code use getters and setters? And if you're a Rails programmer, the answer is yes. If your code uses setters particularly, then you are not writing encapsulated code. You know too much about the internals of the object. Do you have APIs where you have to call things in the correct order? Then you're not encapsulated. You're not OO. Do you have methods that are public so you can test them? Then, now this one I could debate. I could actually see both sides of this one, but uh, technically you're not encapsulated if you do that. And do the errors that you have to handle reveal the implementation? Then again, you're not encapsulated. So I would say that pretty much all of the Ruby code that's being written out there does not have good encapsulation. Composition and delegation. Composition is where we can build uh, composite obje objects from other objects. Delegation is when an object passes its uh, responsibilities off to someone else to handle. How well do we do that? Well, in theory, we can do this really well. Composition, we probably do all the time. Delegation, we don't do anywhere near enough of. How many people here have actually used def delegate? Three, four, all right? We are not doing these techniques anywhere near enough. And as a result, I would say we're not doing OO. And then finally, we have inheritance. Everybody does inheritance. Everybody is wrong to do inheritance <laughs> when it comes to OO. Inheritance does all sorts of things bad to you. It breaks encapsulation. It breaks the encapsulation of state. It breaks the encapsulation of implementation. People argue that, implement, that the inheritance models the real world. So if you say, you know, A is a subclass of B, then you're saying that A is some more specific form of, of this. It's like, you know, sort of like a, um, a user is a kind of human, if you're lucky. Um, that's wrong. If you look at the real world, there are almost no proper ISA relationships. It just doesn't exist. We like to think that we're like these Victorian gentleman scientists that went around classifying butterflies. Right? It doesn't work that way. The real world is messy and ugly and dynamic. It does not have good structure. It does not have good hierarchies. You never model using inheritance. The reason we use inheritance is because we're lazy. We use inheritance so that we can share the, the model, or sorry, share the um, state and behavior of some pre-existing things. This evil started with GUI frameworks, where if you wanted a radio box, you would actually subclass a generic radio box to create your own, right? And then from there on, we've done the same thing until we end up with abominations like that. Channeling my valley girl, this is ridiculous, right? There is no way that even the worst user is a kind of action, application record, or whatever they call it nowadays, right? That's not what it is. This is a classic example of where we should be using delegation and not inheritance. Because by doing inheritance, we have actually meant that every single object that's a user now carries around the entire baggage of active record with it. And so you expect to be able to make all these active record calls on every user. And when they change active record, of course, they never change any of the APIs in Rails. But when they change the active record API, suddenly your entire application breaks, not just the user, but anything that uses the user. This is bad. This is where I can get into trouble. Inheritance is a temptation. 
So I don't think we're doing proper OO. Remember that. Part two, and this is all interrelated, I hope. Part two says that the future is parallel. And I want, there's many reasons for this, but I wanted to show you one. This man is Gordon Moore, and you've all heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law is basically that the most economical number of gates on a silicon wafer will double every n months where n is variously 18 to 24. It does not matter what n is, because this is still exponential growth. And it seems to be holding true. So we're up to the billion mark now, easily. The number of transistors actually just in a process. So the number of transistors on a slab of silicon is obviously way, way more than that. But interestingly, if you look at clock frequency, you'll see that it, it evens out. So around about 2000, it started slowing down. And you know, each generation of computer now, really the clock's about the same as it was before. In fact, there came a period, maybe five years ago, when the clocks actually slowed down between successive releases. And the reason for that is we get more cores instead. So at one point, I got kind of interested into why this was. Right. Why is it that we have more cores and slower clock frequencies? So I discovered something quite interesting. Empirically, the power used by a chip is proportional to the cube of the clock frequency. Now, you can argue for the square quite easily because it's basically, these gates are basically capacitors. And to charge a capacitor, the speed with which you do that depends on the voltage you apply to it. So you've got to increase the voltage to get the capacitor to charge quicker, to switch quicker. And um, power is proportional to voltage squared. But there are other uh, effects that come into play as well. Uh, as the gates get smaller, you get more leakage between them. You get, um, oh, there's all sorts of effects. But the measured effect is that your power use goes up as a cube of your clock frequency. So if you imagine you had a processor, and its clock goes up by just 10%. Well, that means that your power consumption is going to go up 1.1 cubed to 1.33, or increase the power by 33%. And what does power mean? Well, power basically is the same as heat. So your processor is going to dissipate 33% more energy simply because you increase the clock 10%. Has anybody here built a gaming computer? Yeah? You overclock it? And what do you worry about? Heat, heat right? You end up with you know, heat sinks the sizes of toasters <laughs> yeah, sitting on top. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, my son's got one, right? Processor chip that big, heat sink that big, three fans, fins, I have no what. It's incredible. And if you don't do it, that's what happens. But heat is more insidious than that. Roughly one third of the power consumption of the United States is data centers. When you consider that the reaction to scaling a Rails application is we just throw more boxes at it, tell that guy. So why multi-core? You take a processor and reduce its clock speed to 70% of what it was. So if it was a one gig processor, it goes down to 700 meg. The power then drops to 0.7 cubed, or about 33% of what it was. So now what we do is we take three processors it has 210% of the original capacity and uses exactly the same power. And that, my friends, is why we do multi-core. And that's why the trend is only going to increase. We are beginning to hit the boundaries with clock frequency. So as your processes get more and more powerful each year, that power is going to come in, the terms, in, in terms of multiple cores. So 4, 8, 16, 32, 128, whatever. And that is absolutely fantastic. 
except the only way to actually make use of this is to have all of those cores doing something. Right? It's no good if your program is linear, start to be finished, all runs in one thread, it's only going to use one of those cores. It's only going to run at 70% of the speed it used to run at. So because of that, we have no choice. Our future is parallel and concurrent. And just because I always get this wrong, concurrency is programmatic. Concurrency is something you control because you write code that has multiple things going on potentially at the same time. Whereas parallel is a hardware mechanism. You have chunks of code executed at the same instant of time, Einstein notwithstanding. So parallelism is a hardware thing, number of cores available, number of processes available. And parallel programs are concurrent. And concurrency is hard. So here's a little bit of uh, some Ruby code that um, manages people coming into and out of rooms in a building. Okay, so you kind of swipe in or something, right? So this is the thing that says record someone coming into a particular building. So it goes and gets the current state. If the current state is in building, then it's an error. They're in the building twice, that can't be. Otherwise, we now record that they're in the building. Is this code thread safe? No. Because if we had two threads executing, one thread fetches the current state, raises an error uh, if it's not in the building, and sets the state to being in building. Then another thread runs separately and later fetches the current state. It is in building, and therefore it's going to raise an error. But if those two threads are running on two cores, then they could do this. Both of them fetch the current state at the same time. Both of them see that the person is not in the building. And then both of them register the fact that the person is in the building. So we have the person in the building twice, but we only register it once. So that's a bug. So how do we fix that? Well, basically, whenever we have state that is potentially shared, we have the ability to have this kind of bug. And I can pretty much guarantee you that it's not just the ability to have, we will have that kind of bug. And this is nothing to do with OO. It's perfectly good OO design. This would happen equally well if I was writing an assembler. So how do you fix this? Well, they fixed it in the uh, 19th century when they were doing uh, railroad construction. And it got, you know, obviously a train has to be able to go from A to B and then back from B to A, but you don't want to put two tracks all the way from New York to San Francisco. So you have mostly single track, and then you have these sections of two track. But you only want one train at a time on the single track. And that's where they came up with this idea. This is mostly used actually in stations and sidings, um, but it's still effective. You have a flag, physically a flag, just like on the crossings and the roads out there, right? You have a flag. Train on the left wants to go across the track, so the driver gets out, picks up the flag, takes it with him, and that flag gives him or her permission to enter that single line of track. So having got the flag, the train now moves to the other side. The driver is slightly on the other side, so they put the flag down and drive off. Now the train that's waiting on the other side can see the flag. So the driver goes and gets the flag, goes and gets the flag. Excuse me. Ah, oh, all right. Goes and gets the flag, shoots across the other side, and releases the flag. What is that called? That's a semaphore. Literally, that is a physical semaphore. That's what it was called. And that's why we call them semaphores nowadays. Right? The more complicated version of that is the arms that go up and down on those posts, right? Same thing, exactly the same thing. Only one can be up at a time. So in the 1960s, Dijkstra came up with the idea of using this for software, and he called it a semaphore. Um, he has just two operations on it. P and V, P is basically grab the flag, and V is release the flag. Uh, interestingly, no one actually knows what P and V stand for, because Dijkstra can't remember. <laughs> but they're P and V. So if you wanted to write our code with semaphores, you could write something like this. You, um, you have this great, right? Because when you describe this to someone, you say, I P on the semaphore, right? <laughs> So you pee on the access semaphore, you get 
you execute the code, and then you release the semaphore. Is this code correct? Have I just fixed my, my race condition? Yes. Yes, we hear? No, unfortunately, we, we haven't. Because if we raise that exception in the middle, then we are still holding on to that semaphore. And therefore, we will remove the ability for anybody else for the rest of time to call this function. But that's not a race condition. It's not a race condition, but it's a bug. All right? So it actually, to write this code correctly, you'd have to write something like this. Or something like that. This is a trivial method. Imagine you had to do this in a more complicated method. Or you had to do this in a method that had multiple separate conditions that you needed to block on. All right. The possibilities for deadlock in those environments are unbelievable. It is so easy to get this wrong. In fact, I would go so far as to say that any program that has parallel access to shared data contains bugs. I don't think there's any option. <sighs> to fix some of those, about 10 years later, Brinch Hansen and people came up with the idea of a monitor, which is kind of like a semaphore, but it has additional um, functions to it. And they allow you to have, like, to release it in the middle if you're not quite done with using it, but you, don't, you, haven't, you can't finish yet. So you can kind of like release it and then pick it back up again. It's not easy to use. People came up with futures and promises. These are not new. This is not a JavaScript invention. Nothing is a JavaScript invention. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, so a future is simply a way of deferring resolution of a value in a concurrent system. So for example, if I wanted to uh, get the total number of what is this now, Twitter and Facebook messages I've got. I could write code like this, and if you look at that at runtime, it's going to go get the count for whatever it was first, Twitter, then get the count for Facebook, and it's going to take the total of the two elapsed times. So what we'd like to do is to do the two in parallel. And you can do that easily with promises, because what a promise does is returns immediately. It's going to send off your code to run in a separate thread, uh, and it's going to return some kind of magic object that when you call resolve on that object, waits for that other thread to finish, and then comes back with the result. So by doing that, I can actually run the two things in parallel. The code is not much more complicated than the non-parallel version. It's wonderful. And people hold up promises being you know, the answer to concurrency. No, they're not. They allow you to write this kind of concurrency. Uh, they allow you to write that kind of concurrency very easily. But they do not fix the general problem of shared access to the data. Then, 1973, Carl Hewitt comes up with the actor model. In response to a message that he receives, an actor can make local decisions, create more actors, send more messages, determine how to respond to the next message received. Actors may modify private state, but can only affect each other through messages, avoiding the need for locks. So an actor is effectively a separate process that you can only talk to by sending messages to it. Its local state is totally local to it. It's just almost like hardware constrained to be local to that process. And he claims that because of that, we don't need locks anymore. Now, let me point to that definition and ask you, does it remind you of the definition of anything else? Something that you probably use every day. It's encapsulation, but it's more than just encapsulation. How do I interact with this thing? I send it a message. It's an object. An actor is nothing more than an object that runs independently. I'll get back to that. So if I was going to write an actor, it would look something like this. At the top, it's going to wait for a message to arrive. Then it's going to do its business, and at the end, it's going to send a response. And it has a queue. 
there going into it. So if I want to say, OK, Mary has just entered the building, I can send this message to my occupancy agent. It's going to go through the receive message part. It's going to uh, send the response. And then back on the other side, I'm going to do that resolve, whatever it is, to receive the response back. But I don't have to worry about semaphores and everything. If two people enter the building at exactly the same time, it doesn't matter. Because there are two messages will go into the queue. Who cares what order it's in? And each one will be processed sequentially. So in this way, actors actually help you or actually eliminate the need to think about that kind of concurrency. So what does this mean for us and our futures? Well, I always thought if I was Dorothy and I'd gone through all of this you know, danger and hassle and ugliness, and I get to the very end, and that witch says to me, you've always been able to go home. Right? I would punch that witch in the face. <laughs> but we have had the answers all along. We have had functional programming. Functional programming has been around since before OO. They are a pure function, by definition, is, quote, data location independent, right? Their state is always immutable, so we don't need locks. Because the code is, is just totally pure, we can swap functions in and out. One of the cool things about functional programming compared to object-oriented programming is in object-oriented programming, we encapsulate state and behavior. And that represents one of the strongest couplings you can get. And every time you have something coupled to something else, you guarantee it's harder to change. And I switched to doing more functional programming um, three or four years ago. And I tell you, the difference is night and day when it comes to making changes. It's so much easier to change because of that. So we've got functional programming. We have the actor model, which allows us to create objects that are separate processes and keep those things guaranteed to be isolated. So we have something now which is inherently parallel and inherently distributed. And it has a good pedigree. It goes back a long way. And then last, but by no means least, we suddenly have come to a point where we have incredibly good runtime systems for languages. And for all you may love or hate Java, the JVM is a fantastic runtime system for what it does. I remember when JVM first came out, and it was like incredibly slow. And people were saying, no one will ever use this because it's not a real, you know, you can't do real world stuff in it. And the JVM has gone, you know, leaps and bounds and is now fast. It's impressive. Um, it's not the only one. There are many incredible runtime systems out there. Haskell has a great runtime system. Erlang and Elixir have an incredible runtime system for distributed programming. Right? They are all really impressive and typically can perform better than you could write native code because they have had hundreds and hundreds of programmer years going into making them as fast as possible. And I think that is the perfect storm for a change in the industry. I think it's the perfect combination of factors that are going to take us from where we are now to where we're going to be for the next 10 years. So what do you do? What does this make? What difference does this make to you? Right? This is a Ruby conference. Am I sitting here saying, throw away your Ruby? No. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> but I honestly think you need to be looking at functional programming. I think that if you're not currently playing with functional programming language, you should be using it. And Enumerating things in Ruby does not count as functional programming. Okay? I really mean a genuine functional language. And you may say, but Dave, wait a minute. My, my employer doesn't give me time to do that. I'm, I'm busy all day doing this. And the answer is, it's not their job to give you the time to do that. You are a professional developer. 
you are responsible for your own future. Right? You either invest in yourself to be where you want to be, or you will be where you are now. And increasingly, your role will become that of a maintenance programmer. So you owe it to yourself to start looking at these things. Once you start writing a functional language, you will discover something kind of interesting. And that is, do you remember back when you first learned programming, probably somebody wrote a diagram which was input, process, output. Yeah? And that's how programs work. Guess what? That is how programs work. And when you're writing functional programs, that's exactly how they work. Your program is a transformation. Every function is a transformation. You combine functions to make more complicated transformations. And when you start thinking about your Ruby coding as writing transformations, a miraculous thing happens. Your methods drop down to one line each, and your code becomes infinitely easier to change. Start thinking of objects as actors. Rails, in some ways, did the industry the biggest disservice by muddying up object-oriented programming. And we have to get beyond that. We have to start thinking of things, again, as pure objects. And I find a great way to do that is to imagine that they are genuine actors, just totally isolated, their own state, and you interact by sending messages. And then finally, stop caring about the language you're using in terms of, I like this language or I like this framework. Because I think increasingly, it's the characteristics of the runtime that determine what you can do, not the characteristics of the language. The idea that, OK, yeah, Ruby is slow, but it doesn't matter if we can throw processes at it. That doesn't work anymore. Not when we're scaling to the kind of sizes we're scaling to. When we're talking about millions of concurrent connections. That's just not feasible. It's not economic. So you have to find the runtimes that actually support what you want to do, and then the languages on top of those. So Gibson widely quoted, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. I think what we need to do is start distributing it, right? right? We have all of these things now. We have the capability to do this today. We don't have to wait for the future. We can create the future by distributing the present. And we do that by distributed programming. The other thing about this that I find is that playing around in these new environments with these new technologies is incredibly rewarding. So just remember to have fun while you're doing all this. And I did it. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>